Lily, on regaining the Gormer grounds, struck rapidly across the lawn towards the unfinished house, where she fancied that her hostess might be speculating, not too resignedly, on the cause of her delay, for, like many unpunctual persons, Miss Gormer disliked to be kept waiting. As Miss Bart reached the avenue, however, she saw a smart pantheon with a high step pair uh, with a pantheon with a high stepping pair disappear behind the shrubbery in the direction of the gate, and on the doorstep stood Mrs. Gormer with a glow of retrospective pleasure on her open countenance. At the sight of Lily, the glow deepened to an embarrassed red, and she said with a slight laugh, "Did you see my visitors? Oh, I thought you came back by the avenue." It was Miss, Mrs. George Dorset. She said she'd drop in to make a neighborly call. She dropped. Lily met the announcement with her usual composure, though her experience of Bertha's idiosyncrasies would not have led her to include the neighborly instinct among them. And Mrs. Gormer, relieved to see that she gave no sign of surprise, went on with a depreciating laugh. Of course, what really brought her was curiosity. She made me take her all over the house. But no one could have been nicer, no airs, you know, and so good-natured. I can't quite see why people think her so fascinating. This surprising event, coinciding too completely with her meeting with Dorset, to be regarded as contingent upon it, had yet immediately struck Lily with a vague sense of foreboding. It was not in Bertha's habits to be neighborly, much less to make advance, advances to anyone outside the immediate circle of her affinities. She had always consistently ignored the world of outer aspirants, or had recognized its individual members only when prompted by motives of self-interest, and the very capriciousness of her condescensions had, as Lily was aware, given them special value in the eyes of the persons she distinguished. Lily saw this now in Mrs. Gormer, Mrs. Gormer's unconcealed complacency, and in the happy irrelevance with which, for the next day or two, she quoted Bertha's opinions and speculated on the origin of her gown. All the secret ambitions which Mrs. Gormer's native indolence and the attitude of her companions kept in habitual abeyance were now germinating, germinating afresh in the glow of Bertha's advances, and whatever the cause of the latter, Lily saw that, if they were followed up, they were likely to have a disturbing effect upon her own future. She had arranged to break the length of her stay with her new friends by one or two visits to other acquaintances as recent, and, on her return from this somewhat depressing excursion, she was immediately conscious that Mrs. Dorset's influence was still in the air. There had been another exchange of visits, a tea at a country club, and an encounter at a hunt ball. There was even a rumor of an approaching dinner, which Maddie Gormer, with a natural effort at discretion, tried to smuggle out of the conversation whenever Miss Bart took part in it. The latter had already planned her to return to town after a farewell Sunday with her friends, and, with Gertie Farish's aid, had discovered a small private hotel where she might establish herself for the winter. The hotel being on the edge of a fashionable neighborhood, the price of, of the few square feet she was to occupy was considerably in excess of her means, but she found a justification for her dislike of poorer quarters in the argument that, at this particular juncture, it was of the utmost importance to keep up a show of prosperity. In reality, it was impossible for her, while she had the means to pay her way for a week ahead, to lapse into a form of existence like Gertie Farish's. She had never been so near the brink of insolvency, but she could at least manage to meet her weekly hotel bill, and having settled the heaviest of her previous debts out of the money she had received from Trenor, she had still fair margin of credit to go on. The situation, however, was not agreeable enough to lull her to complete, to complete, to complete unconsciousness of its insecurity. Her rooms, with their cramped outlook on, the, on a sallow vista of brick walls and fire escapes, her lonely meals in the dark restaurant with its surcharged ceiling and haunting smell of coffee, all these material discomforts, which were yet to be accounted as so many privileges soon to be withdrawn, kept constantly before her the disadvantages of her state, and her mind reverted the more insistently to Mrs. Fisher's counsels. Beat about the question as she would, she knew the outcome of it was that she must try to marry Rosedale, and in this conviction she was fortified by an unexpected visit from George Dorset. She found him, 
on the first Sunday after her return to town, pacing her narrow sitting room to the imminent peril of a few knick-knacks with which she had tried to disguise its plush exuberances. But the sight of her seemed to quiet him, and he said meekly that he hadn't come to bother her, that he had only he had asked only to be allowed to sit for half an hour and talk of anything she liked. In reality, as she knew, he had but one subject, himself and his wretchedness, and in it was the need of her sympathy that had drawn him back. But he began with a pretense of questioning her about herself, and, as she replied, she saw that, for the first time, a faint realization of her plight penetrated the dense surface of his self-absorption. Was it possible that her old beast of an aunt had actually cut her off? That she was living alone like this because there was no one else for her to go to? And that she really hadn't more than enough to keep alive on till the wretched little legacy was paid? The fibers of sympathy were nearly atrophied in him, but he was su suffering so intensely that he had a faint glimpse of what other sufferings might mean, and, as she perceived, an an almost simultaneous perception of the way in which her particular misfortunes might serve him. When, at length, she dismissed him on the pretext that she must dress for dinner, he lingered entreatingly on the threshold to blurt out, It's been such a comfort. Do say you'll let me see you again. But to this direct appeal it was impossible to give an assent, and she said, with faint decisiveness, I'm sorry, but you know why I can't. He colored to the eyes, pushed the door shut, and stood before her, embarrassed but insistent. I know how you might, if you would, if things were different, and it lies with you to make them so. It's just a word to say, and you'll put me out of my misery. Their eyes met, and for a second she trembled again with the nearness of the temptation. You're mistaken. I know nothing. I saw nothing, she exclaimed, striving by sheer force of reiteration to build a barrier between herself and her peril. And, as he turned away, groaning out, You sacrifice us both, she continued to repeat, as if it were a charm, I know nothing, absolutely nothing. 